Subject for our discussion and the second session is a question of power. All leaders exercise power. <clears throat> if you like, power goes with the job. The leaders are the ones who decide what's to be done, who does it, when it's to be done, how it's to be done. <clears throat> That's powerful stuff. Now, power is exhilarating stuff to use. It's what attracts people very often to positions of leadership, to be able to call the shots, send the troops into action, make the decisions, and so on. That's exciting stuff. <clears throat> what we don't often realize is that power is not only exciting stuff to use, it is also dangerous. It is dangerous not only to those that it's used on, it is dangerous to those who use it. Lord Acton, a British statesman of a century or so ago, said one time, I understand, <clears throat> all power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Power is corrupting stuff. And the record of leadership, public leadership, and church leadership, for that matter, is littered with the lives of good men and good women who have been destroyed by handling power. And we need to understand why. Some people would say, well, power itself is morally neutral. It's not power that's wrong, it's the people who use it. God is not in danger of being corrupted by his omnipotence. Power brings blessing as well as curse. And yet there seems there is something strangely wrong with power in the world today if it causes such damage in the people who use it. And I want us to understand what's happened to power to make it as dangerous as it is. In uh, Isaiah chapter 14, <clears throat> there's a passage that generally is taken to be the account of the fall of Lucifer. From verse 12, <clears throat> How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the, na laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I'll raise my throne above the stars of God. I'll sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the cloud. I will make myself like the Most High. And Satan, reaching for power that was not his by right, corrupted power at its source. Power, if you like, is the strength or the might or the potency to get your will done in the face even of dysfunctional circumstances or opposition. And in that sense, all power belongs to God. Psalm 62 verse 11, once I have spoken, twice God has said that power belongs to God. Power flows from God's throne. And Satan saying, I will ascend above the stars of God, I will make myself like the Most High, is seeking to seize hold of power. And in doing so, he corrupted it. So you find that in the fall, Satan, who said, I'll be like the Most High, <clears throat> says to Adam and Eve, eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you can be like God. And in the fall, what happened <clears throat> was immediately there is a power struggle. First of all, between the sexes. Instead of the cooperation of equals, now there is domination on one side, manipulation on the other. The first family blows apart in murder. And a power struggle has stained the whole of the human race ever since. What's more, when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost authority over creation. And into the power vacuum so created, Satan comes. And Satan, who is the archon or the ruler of the demons, now becomes the archon or the ruler of the world system. And in the spiritual realm, he establishes what? His principalities and power, see. Man builds a city, and the city becomes a power. The city becomes a symbol of man's corporate rebellion. Babylon, the city, says, I am, and there is none beside me. I will never sit as a widow. I will never lack children. God says in Isaiah 45, I am, and there is no other God but me. The city says, I am, and there is no other God, none beside me. I will never sit as a widow. I will never lack children. <coughs> And there is in the, uh, in the world today that rebellious power drive that corrupts everything that man has put his hands to do. <clears throat> the tragedy of it is this, that in the, in the church we are handling currently, I believe, the same kind of power that's operating in the world. 
and it's bringing the same disastrous results into organization after organization, church after church and so on, ruining the lives of people who started off with great ideals and, uh, and so on. <coughs> Power is very dangerous stuff. And the Bible gives a very incisive analysis of some of the dangers of power, of handling power. And I want us to understand very clearly what they are. The first of them is pride. <clears throat> now pride is actually <clears throat> fallen confidence. Pride is self-confidence that's gone astray. And you see, leaders need to have confidence. Leaders without confidence will never lead people successfully. Leaders, as we said in the last session, have to have the confidence to step out into the uncertain future, being sure within themselves when we face problems, we'll find the answer. <clears throat> if that confidence is not in the heart of their people, then there's a good deal of uncertainty around. You can tell a lot about the leadership in an organization by speaking to the people. Not about the leaders, but speak to people. It tells you a lot about the leaders in the organization. I've been to some churches and some businesses, for that matter, too, where everything seems to be going well. Numbers are up, uh, revenue's coming in, everything's flourishing. Talk to people, and oddly enough, there's a kind of a uncertainty. They say, well, yeah, things are fine now, but... And you wonder what the but is all about until you speak to the leaders. You know what you discover? The people are tapping into the uncertainty in the hearts of their leaders. You have to reckon on this fact that people are highly sensitized to your emotional and your spiritual states. They read you, not deliberately, instinctively. And if you're unsure of yourself, of yourself that the uncertainty will percolate down all, the, all levels of the organization. So confidence is a prerequisite for leaders. You go into some places that are going through real hard times. Talk to people and you find a, a surprising air of buoyancy. They say, well, things are bad now, but we'll get through. They know what they're doing up there. We'll be fine. They're tapping into the confidence that's in the hearts of their leaders. Leaders cannot function without confidence, but confidence, successful confidence, can easily spill over into pride. And pride elevates us at the expense of other people. That's the evil of pride. And all the language of, of leadership uh, <clears throat> builds that up, see. For example, we talk about the leaders as being what? The superiors. The followers are the subordinates. People get promoted up the ladder. Orders come down from the top. And that vertical uh, status thing uh, nourishes pride in the hearts of those who are in positions of leadership. <clears throat> the second one the Bible talks about is arrogance. Arrogance is the unwillingness or the resentment of being checked, opposed, criticized, or, or questioned in any way. <clears throat> Jeremiah says, we have heard of the pride of Moab. He's very proud and very arrogant. Now you see, leaders have to be willing and able to carry the day against opposing opinions. If you've got leaders who are swayed by every opposition from one side or another, they'll never lead people, see. But our very success in carrying the day against opposition can lead, easily lead us to become arrogant. Where we say, second opinions I do not need, particularly yours. <clears throat> I know what I'm doing, please be quiet. And that's arrogance, see. And when leaders become sensitive about being, about being criticized, take personally any opposition to their plans, then the seeds of arrogance are probably already flourishing in their hearts. See. And arrogance and pride almost always lead to deception. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you, the prophet said. Why is that? <clears throat> Unless I'm willing for my opinions and my ideas to be, to be exposed to the acid of objective criticism, I'm always in danger of somewhere along the line <clears throat> of making gross misjudgments and not being able to see what I'm doing. I can remember in the uh, church I was involved in in New Zealand years ago, <clears throat> we had one brother on the eldership who quite literally was a pain in the neck. He criticized everything, he questioned everything, he couldn't get the simplest idea without having a list of objections this long. He was my insurance policy. I wouldn't have got rid of him for the world. 
very awkward to live with, but I knew I'd never get far astray with that brother around, see, because he questioned everything. And you'll notice sometimes that the very worst person in the very worst situation with their very worst intention sometimes says the very right thing, doesn't he? And if criticism, even unjustified criticism, has this great, great blessing that it saves us from becoming arrogant, if we listen to it. Okay. <clears throat> the third thing the Bible speaks about, the third danger of handling power, is self-aggrandizement. Leaders who use their position for their own personal gain, to build up their own standing, their own uh, lifestyle, their own comfort, their own reputation or whatever, who use their position for their own ends. There are two important Good Shepherd chapters in the Bible, one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. The Good Shepherd chapter in the New Testament is John chapter 10. The Good Shepherd chapter in the Old Testament is Ezekiel chapter 34. And Ezekiel 34 begins with a condemnation of the shepherds of Israel. And the biblical image of the leader is almost always the shepherd. <coughs> so God is speaking against the leaders of Israel. And he's speaking against shepherds who clothe themselves with the wool, God says, who slaughter the fat sheep, who feed themselves and not the flock. And what God is underlining there is this. The only reason why the shepherds have a job is for the sake of the sheep. The sheep are not there to give the shepherd a job. Leaders need to remember this. The only reason you're a leader is because there are people who need to be led. The people are not there to give you the job or fulfill your desires or your plans as a leader. And uh, when leaders do, <clears throat> and start, uh, do not do that, and start to use their position and the access to power and knowledge that that gives them, for their own ends. People may struggle to feel committed, but in their heart of hearts they feel somehow ripped off, they feel used, they feel they've been taken advantage of. And when leaders use their position to avoid some of the hardships that their people go through, then they soon lose the people's respect. When they find the leaders taking the soft options and able to do that because of their position, self aggrandizement The fourth danger that's mentioned is <clears throat> insensitivity. Now again, leaders often have to insist on people doing things that they really don't, le don't, don't like, or doing things at a time that are inconvenient uh, for them. The job just has to be done. I'm sorry. I know it's inconvenient, I don't, you know, don't like it, but you're Johnny on the spot, it just has to be done, please get on with it, that kind of thing. And from time to time, leaders have to insist on that for the sake of the mission, for the sake of the task. But again, if they're not careful, that can lead them to become insensitive to other people's rights or other people's inconvenience. Well, it's part of his job, what's he grumbling about? She gets paid for it, what's the moan? See? And leaders can become detached from their people, and unkindness can, can, can creep in. One of the very important characteristics of the character of a leader uh, <coughs> is kindness. Kindness is built on a sense of kinship. When we're kind to somebody, what we're really saying is in similar circumstances, that is the kind of thing that I'd like you to do for me. And we must never lose that sense of kinship. It is possible to reprimand people, to discipline people, to monitor people, to do it severely sometimes if need be, and still do it kindly, as long as there is in us that sense of kinship. As long as there is in our hearts something that says to them, in similar circumstances, that's exactly the right way for you to treat me. I don't want to be treated any differently from that. If, if that's there, then even discipline can be kindly. Now leaders by their very, by virtue of their position, <clears throat> often move in circles that are slightly different from those of their people. They mix with other leaders. Uh, their uh, offices are, are on a different floor and so on. And they can easily lose touch with other people so they can act unkindly and not be aware of it. 
and the insensitivity that doesn't take account of the cost uh, of the tasks that people are called upon to do can easily lose people's uh, heart and lose their commitment. There's a very good example of that in uh, uh, the history of Israel when Rehoboam, Solomon's son, came to the throne. And uh, Rehoboam had a deputation from the ten northern tribes seeking for a reduction in taxes. And so Rehoboam asked advice of the elders, those who had guided his father. And they said to him, if you'll listen to this people, if you'll be their servant, that's interesting, isn't it? If you'll be their servant, they will follow you all the days of your life. Of your life. Then Rehoboam went to his peers, the young men who had grown up with him, the yuppies, the power-hungry uh, guys who had just come to places of power. And he asked their advice. <coughs> They said, we'll tell you how to fix those guys. You just say this to them. You say, my finger is thicker than my father's loins. My father scourged you with whips, I'll scourge you with scorpions. Send them on their way. That insensitivity lost Rehoboam 10 out of the 12 tribes. And we can lose the hearts of our people very easily by uh, <clears throat> that, kind of, that kind of insensitivity. Sometimes it begins just by ingratitude, taking things for granted, it can lead us to be very careless about people's feelings. Okay. Another thing that happens <coughs> uh, very easily with power, and a very corrupting thing, is manipulation. Manip manipulation is where leaders seek to achieve their ends by underhand means. That seek to control the outcome before it's actually taken place. Now it can begin by uh, politicking, it be can begin by organizing the agenda, by getting people on your side and so on, but it somehow it robs people of their freedom of response. <coughs> And uh, it's, a very, it's a very demeaning thing for people to find themselves being manipulated into certain positions. Now again, leaders need to be effective influencers. You're required to impart the vision to your people, you're required to, you're required to motivate them along the way, you're required to persuade them, to commit themselves wholeheartedly to your call and so on. You need to be effective influencers. But influencing must never descend to manipulation. And when it does, when we re resort to unfair means to make sure we're going to get our own way, then uh, people feel used. And it's a ready way of losing people's respect. Another one is domination. One of the things about power is that it's so attractive to handle that leaders are always reluctant to give it up. And domination is holding on to a position of power by any means, fair or foul. It can begin by uh, stacking a meeting with your supporters. It can begin uh, by quite uh, simple, almost innocent ways that can descend to character assassination, railroading opposition, and so on. Domination. Uh, happens very often. You know, the person who says, well, I know I've got to step aside and let the young men have their day. It's time for younger leaders but not just yet, you know, they're not quite ready. I mean, if I was to go now, it'd be disastrous. I need to be around for a year or two yet, give them a bit more uh, experience before I'm ready to step aside. And they postpone that and postpone that and postpone that almost indefinitely. That's domination. <coughs> the final one is tyranny. When you get to this stage, the people are no longer even being used, they're victims. Tyranny has been described as the, 
as those who are law to themselves and take on a mantle of piety. That's what uh, has been expressed there. Where leaders are not accountable to anyone. They just believe somehow they've got the right to uh, make the decisions there and uh, uh, use people under them without any compunction whatsoever. Now that's a downward slide. And it begins up here with these things, pride and arrogance. And I believe that leaders need to take very careful account of their own hearts on this, because if we think that we are exempt from it, the possibility is that it's already taken root in our hearts. Now in the world they're very conscious of these baleful effects of, effects of power on people. They try, to, they try to overcome it in two different ways. One is by balancing power. That is, instead of having all the power in one power source, you divide it up. So in uh, many modern political systems, for example, you can have the executive branch, in your case the president, you can have the legislative branch, the Congress or the Senate, the judicial branch, the law courts. And so power is divided between those three power sources. The aim being that if one or other of them tries to get too much power, he will then have two powerful opponents that will hold, uh, hold him in check. Now that is, that is some measure of relief, but it operates only where there is at least a tacit agreement that power should be shared. And uh, our political history today shows time and time again there's no protection against the misuse of power. Anybody who can muster enough muscle or enough guns can cancel a constitution, uh, sack the, uh, the executive, imprison the legislators, take over power by force. So that's not an effective way permanently of, of solving the, the problem of power. The second approach is to change the leaders. It's a realistic uh, admission that power corrupts leaders, and so after the leaders have been in for a while, the, the uh, understanding is that lot's corrupt, get rid of them, put a pure bunch in, knowing full well that in a few years' time the pure ones will be corrupted, and you'll have to change them all over again. So that doesn't really work. Now here's the... the, the uh, a uh, critical point I, I'm, I'm leading to on this. <clears throat> the thing the church needs to understand, and I don't really think the church has heard it or understood it, is that Christ has done something about power itself. Christ has redeemed power. Next book I write is going to be a book about the cross. Because I believe we have never really understood half the dimensions of the cross. And it's important uh, for, the, for the church to do that because we're living in a day when, when uh, we, need, uh, we need new leaders. And yet it's not enough just to have another lot of leaders if they're going to handle power that corrupts them. I remember some years ago in our church in New Zealand, we had a prayer meeting one lunchtime of all the people from the church who were involved in business in our town. I was surprised how many there were. And I remember a young builder got up in the middle of the, uh, of the meeting, in, uh, in the prayer meeting, and he prayed, Lord, I want you to put power in this hand, this town rather, in the hands of righteous men. And part of my heart said, Amen, and part of my heart said, That's not enough. Not enough to put power in the hands of righteous men, otherwise eventually those righteous men will become unrighteous. We need something different. We need righteous power in the hands of righteous men. And that's the dramatic thing. And uh, what we need to understand is that on the cross, 
Jesus has redeemed this whole issue of power. And what we need today is for the church to understand and, uh, and uh, embrace the nature of that redeemed power and how access to that redeemed power is obtained. And when that uh, redeemed power has been, uh, has been embraced, then you can have power that leaders can handle and not be corrupted by it. Let me just uh, push the whole thing out uh, a little bit further. If you look at first century Palestine, the land into which Jesus came, he came at a time that Paul calls in Galatians the fullness of times. In other words, it was exactly the right time for Jesus to come. Jesus came into a land in first, first century Palestine that was dominated by the powers. And I want us to understand the nature of these powers. If you go back to Genesis 1.28, just turn to Genesis 1.28. We have a passage here that's generally called the Dominion Mandate or the Creation Mandate. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The dominion mandate had two components. Number one, be fruitful and multiply. That began to be fulfilled with the beginnings of the human family. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Human family is a divine design, not a biological or sociological uh, construct. It's a divine design. Therefore, it has within it the capacity not just to survive, but to brilliantly succeed. And uh, part of my prayer is that Christian couples have far more confidence in God's design in the Christian family than often they do. The second component of the dominion mandate was rule. Rule over the earth and subdue it. And that began to be fulfilled with the origins of the human city. Genesis chapter 4 verse 17. The first thing that Cain did after he was driven out from the presence of the Lord was to build a city. <coughs> I'd like to draw your attention to the symbol of the city because the symbol of the city runs through Scripture from Genesis chapter 4 to Revelation chapter 22. The city in the Old Testament is the symbol that Paul uses in the New Testament when he talks about the powers. You just think how much of Bible history is built around cities. <clears throat> Tyre and Sidon, Sodom, Gomorrah, Rome, Damascus, Nineveh, Babylon, uh, Samaria, Jerusalem. What are they? Cities, 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 cities. Some of them have become household names. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of names that have sunk into antiquity. We don't really understand their significance. But the Bible is full of cities. The city is the enduring symbol of man's corporate creation. Let me just uh, approach it this way. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, it says this, He that is Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The all things of creation, because that's what the passage is talking about, include these components. 
Firstly, it includes reality structured in two dimensions, both real. One the natural, two the spiritual. All reality is structured in two dimensions, the natural and the spiritual. We know that in the spiritual realm, there are orders of creation that dwell wholly within the realm of spirit. The angels and the archangels and the cherubims and seraphims, they're the good guys. The demons and the unclean spirits, they're the bad guys. They are spirit beings who inhabit wholly the realm of spirit. We know there are some orders of creation who inhabit wholly the realm of matter. the birds and the bees and the rocks and the trees and so on, the flora and fauna, if you like, the orders of nature. Man is the only being God made <clears throat> who inhabits at one and the same time the realm of matter and the realm of spirit. In other words, you are a spirit being, you are embodied spirit or incarnate spirit might be a better term. The, the elements and the, <coughs> and the amino acids in your body are the same as they're in that material world out there. But there's another dimension. You're a spirit being. <coughs> and the spiritual realm is the source of man's life. We live off spirit. Can you remember the last time you spoke to somebody? It's one of those times when you really clicked, you know, the vibes were right, or how we like to express it. What did it feel like, I ask you, after a time like that? How did you feel after a time like that? You feel alive? You feel exhilarated? You feel turned on? You've reached for spirit, you've touched spirit. We are spirit beings and we live off spirit. <clears throat> the life that's in us is not, you don't have two kinds of life in your one physical life, another spiritual life, you have only one kind of life, you have spirit. The body without the spirit is dead, James says. Not only does the source of man's life come out from the realm of spirit, the source of man's problems come from spirit. Sin is a spiritual problem. Sickness is a spiritual problem. It comes from the same realm. Demons are spirit beings. That's why the gospel always links, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons at least suggests to have a common origin. So man is a spirit being, <clears throat> and the orders of creation, the all things of creation, consist of reality in two dimensions, beings who inhabit the realm of spirit, beings who inhabit, inhabit the realm of matter, and man who inhabits both realms. But the all things of creation also include man's creations. Man creates. God, who is the uncreated creator, has made man to be a created creator. And man's corporate creations take the form of the city. Now I want us to understand the inner history of the city because it will explain much of what we're going to deal with in the next session this afternoon. When man builds his cities, the first thing that happens is the city is named. Now in the Bible, names are not just titles. A name always expresses a character or a personality. So the city has a character. Nineveh, for example, is always the bloody city. Tyre is the jubilant city. Sidon is the mistress of sorceries. Babylon, the mother of harlots. Jerusalem, the faithful city, and so on. The city has a character. And that's true today. In geographical cities. London is different from Paris. It's different from New York. It's different from Chicago. It's different from Sydney. The city has an inner character. Now the city as a symbol is very wide-ranging. At the macro level, 
The city represents the nation or the state. The first states were city-states. At the micro level, the city re represents individual institutions or organizations. A business is a city. Outreach publications is a city. A college is a city. Sometimes a family represents a city. A church is a city in these terms. The symbol covers the whole of those from the largest uh, of them all, the nation or the empire for that matter, to the individual institution. And each of those has a distinctive character. I was speaking in a seminar in Oxford in England uh, two or three weeks ago, and one of the, uh, it was a business seminar, one of the men came up to me afterwards and said, what are you talking about? He said, I can confirm. He was an executive of one of the oil companies. He said, I can go to a cocktail party where there are people there from six or seven oil companies, and without knowing where they're from, in five minutes I've got to tell you exactly where they've come from, see, because each one's got a different character. It's true about a church, it's true about a business, true about a geographical area. The city has a character, it's named. The second thing that happens to the city in Scripture is that the city becomes a power. Very early in its history, the city gathers everything to itself. Civilization grows up in the city. Trade develops from the city. Wealth flows into the city. Military power comes from the city. Oppression rises in the city. The occult arts rise in the city. The city, in other words, becomes a power. And when it becomes a power, it has an enduring life beyond the level of the founding fathers. In other words, this power is a corporate spirit. Because we are spirit beings, when we form a corporate organization that survives for any length of time, there comes into being a corporate spirit that soon becomes independent of the people who formed it in the first place. I think I became aware of this for the first time years ago in New Zealand when we had uh, in our town a Baptist minister from London who had come out on a sabbatical. He had suffered a burnout. And uh, he lived just down the road from us, came along to our church, got to know that brother quite well. We're still close friends. But I remember the last night he spent with us before he and his wife left to go back to, uh, from New Zealand to England. He was speaking to me about his early life. He was a man in his early 50s. Speaking about how much he'd suffered from lack of fathering. His father had been a man who sacrificed everything for his career. His father had, ri had risen to be the head of the London Metropolitan Transport Board. Had been decorated by the Queen of England for public services and so on. But it ruined his family in the process. And while he was speaking, he took off a gold watch he was wearing around his wrist. And he said, Tom, that's, you know, that's all that's left of 52 years of my father's life. His father spent 52 years in the London Metropolitan Transport Board. He said, that's all that's left of 52 years of my father's life. When he said that, my heart sank. I thought, what is that thing called the London Metropolitan Transport Board that takes 52 years of a man's life, ruins his family, and gives him a gold watch at the end. See? Now, it's not the people in the board, because the ones who are there now weren't there in his father's day. The ones who were there in his father's day weren't there 100 years before. The London Metropolitan Transport Board was. See? What is it? It is a living thing. It is a, it is a power. See? And it, the power has an enduring life beyond the, the, the lifespan of the people who form it in the first place. See? So in Isaiah chapter 46, Babylon, the city, says what? 
I am, and there is none beside me. I will never sit as a widow. I will never lack children. There. Now, this is important for us to understand because we're living today in the day of what? The mega city and the superpower. There. The enormous, enormous cities in the third world. Millions of 15, 20 million people around some of those enormous cities. What for? What's sucking them in? For a better way of life? Don't you believe it? Thousands, you know, in Manila, living in the rubbish dumps around the city. What's drawing them there? The city, the power there. There, there, there is a, an inner life there that uh, uh, cannot be identified with people. It is a superhuman level. There. And that's what Paul refers to when he speaks about principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, rulers, and so on in the New Testament. The city has become an end in itself. And instead of people, uh, it's serving people, people serve it. It uses people here. Now that, that's true about a business. In a business, loyalty is demanded to what? To the business. What is the business? Not the managers. They're also serving the business here. Not even the stockholders. They're required to contribute capital. There's a life, an enduring life there that's running the whole thing. See? It's stamping its character and its value system uh, on the people that, that, uh, that it uses. And we have to understand the dimensions of that corporate spirit and the reality of it as far as, uh, as the secular city is concerned. There's a lot in Scripture, for example, <clears throat> about the high places. Uh, and the places around the, uh, the hilltops, the high places where they built the temples. Now, spiritually, we hold the high ground. We hold the high places. We are, the Bible says, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But who holds the high places in the city? You just go down and look at the skyline. Banks, insurance companies, multinationals. I want to ask you, why are they building those huge skyscrapers up there? Why, why are they building those gleaming towers up into the sky? They are making a spiritual statement. They are saying, here, we hold the power up there. Here, we have the resources. Here, you bow the knee to us. We were in Melbourne a few months ago, a uh, huge uh, edifice going up right across the main street of Melbourne. <coughs> the, one of the major, or the major brewery in Victoria is building its headquarters there. And when it's finished, nobody up and down the streets of Melbourne can es escape being faced by that statement there of power. See? Now, we need to come to terms with this because if we're honest, we can sing all the victorious songs of Zion we like in church on Sunday and talk about taking the land and so on. How do you feel when you go to work on Monday morning? Totally powerless, see. That's the purpose, see. They're making a spiritual statement, a power statement here. The city has become a power. And it uses people. It shapes people, it molds people, uh, uses people to build itself. Its drive is in these directions. One, survival. The city will do anything to survive. I remember being in Germany uh, last year, year before last. I was taken around uh, a German city called Rottenburg. Uh, before the Second World War, Rottenburg was an ancient walled city, uh, quite a uh, historic, tourist, touristy kind of place, a lot of historical interest. In the last weeks of the Second World War, the Allied Air Forces bombed Rottenburg out of existence. There was no military target. It was a time when they were seeking to finally break the spirit of the German nation. So they just obliterated Rottenburg. The artillery bar uh, batteries were ready to blow it right off the map when apparently the then American Secretary of State intervened and said there's enough is enough. Yeah. If you go around Rottenburg now, the whole thing has been rebuilt exactly the way it was before. And walking around the walls of Rottenburg is like walking around the walls of Jerusalem in, in Nehemiah's day because every yard or so there's a little plaque, the names of people who have contributed money to rebuild Rottenburg. There are German names, there are Japanese names, there are American names, there are British names. All over the world, people have apparently given money to rebuild Rottenburg. I ask myself, why rebuild Rottenburg? I mean, the thing had no commercial or uh, significance at all. Why didn't they just bulldoze it down and build a, mo a modern city somewhere else? I'll tell you why. Rottenburg refused to die. 
the city wouldn't die. The city generated that interest, generated that money, got itself rebuilt. The instinct of the, of the city is always survival. I can remember a prime minister, former prime minister of New Zealand being interviewed on television. And the interviewer said, Mr. Prime Minister, what is the first principle of government? Now you might think the first principle of government is justice. Or you might even think the first principle of government is to govern. No, no, he had a dead right. He said, the first principle of government is to stay in power. See? Do anything to survive. See? Now, <clears throat> what, what's surviving? There's a, there's a, there's a life there. See, that is why, that is why so very often business takeovers are such a bitter uh, uh, struggle. See? Because there, there are two cities in conflict. And one is about to take the other, take the other over. See? Because you're, deal you're dealing with a corporate spirit. The second thing about the city is its drive is always towards self-aggrandizement. Success oriented, always. That is why a city, a church, for example, will even use the name of Christ and the gospel to build its own reputation. Not the people, something behind the people, not flesh and blood, it's principalities and powers. And thirdly, the direction that leads to is drive is always idolatrous. In other words, it will always seek to be the ultimate authority in the lives of the people it uses. Take a, a break there and we'll come back. Just go on with this this afternoon.